Welcome to the Media CFO Podcast, the show where we talk to people on the front lines of finance, business affairs, legal and strategy in the media and entertainment industry. I'm your host, Tobias Jaeger, and when I'm not hosting this podcast, I'm the CFO of television and content studio Colibri Studios in London. Today, we're joined by senior entertainment banker Marie-Josée Corbet of National Bank of Canada, or rather Banque Nationale du Canada. Marie-Josée started her career as an attorney, and by specializing in representing talent and productions, she became a pioneer in Canadian entertainment law before transitioning to producer and ultimately banker. Today, Marie-Josée works with entertainment clients in Canada and around the world and is instrumental in making some of the most prolific projects and co-productions a reality. So welcome, Marie-Josée. Thank you for making the time, for being here. How has Barkett been so far for you? It's been uh, very, uh, very productive, mm. very productive. It's always nice to uh, meet existing clients in another context. Yep. and meet uh, potential new clients and uh, partners. Yep. So, uh, no, it's been very productive. I'm quite happy. It's always like a, a marathon. It is, it is. Yes. I was about to say. Yes. So the first day is always <laughs> overwhelming, yep. and then uh, you get into it. And, yep. uh, you know, because you see people and you're like, oh, you know, it's like a lot of energy in the room. Yes. And then yes. you're just trying to kind of conserve this because you're like, oh, hold on, there's four more days of this. Um, you're obviously working... Uh, as a banker now, I understand you initially, uh, uh, you know, studied law. You got a law degree, but you worked in production as well. Tell us a little bit more about your journey, how you got uh, into the business, um, and and got to see so many different sides of it. Well, when I um, finished law school, I was uh, hired as an entertainment lawyer entirely by coincidence. Okay. Um, there was no uh, entertainment law course at the time, <laughs> um, and except maybe for the fact that uh, when I was interviewed by this law firm, uh, they could tell that I was passionate about arts, about okay. cinema and yeah. television. I had been a part of an amateur troupe theater for mm -hmm. several years. Okay. So they uh, could see that I knew nothing about entertainment law, <laughs> but that I at least I had an interest for the sector. Yeah. So uh, I was uh, hired by this law firm, and I practiced law for about six, seven years. Okay. At a time where really the industry was uh, booming in Canada, it was the start of you know, like uh, high-budget television drama. Mm -hmm. It was the start of uh, pay TV channels. Okay, yeah. uh, it was really like uh, a, a wonderful time to start in the industry. Uh, but at a point, I felt that uh, I was not nurtured enough, that I was mm. more interested by the business side of things and by, by production. Yeah. So uh, I had a wonderful opportunity to join a production company, initially as head of business and legal. <laughs> Makes uh, sense. It was the, the perfect entry to yeah. production. And then uh, really started to get more involved in uh, deal making, uh, mm -hmm. attending markets, becoming more involved at the international level being more involved with uh, co-productions mm. and with production in, in general. Then uh, was uh, hired by another production company, but as head of uh, VP of International Affairs. Okay. So I was in, in charge. I was really hired as executive producer, but really trying to uh, finance international productions, not uh, working on local programming, really working on the international side of yeah. things. So really like a really gradual progression yeah. uh, from law to Increasing business levels of to production, yeah. to, <laughs> to production yeah. but at the international level. Yeah. And then uh, started my own company mm -hmm. where, you know, we were two partners and I was more the uh, business, financial, strategic mm -hmm. side. Mm -hmm. And uh, then had the opportunity to join the, the bank where uh, 
it, it was really a combination of what I had done in the past. Yeah. Maybe th- not at the production level, but uh, all other aspects, but from the other side of the fence. Yeah. Uh, so that's essentially uh, how I came to the uh, banking industry. I mean, it's quite fascinating because it seems like you got to see the industry from pretty much every angle that there is, you know, from producer from the lawyer that makes the deal, now from the banking side, um, which is also, you know, you have to put your investor glasses or hat on uh, and um, really see all the perspectives you can have about, you know, with one project, you can always look at it, you know, from different angles, you know, from the creative side, from the production side. And it looks like, like throughout the career, you've seen pretty much all of them, you know, Yes, and I think that what also makes it interesting is that at the bank, we're about uh, 45 professionals all across wow. Canada. Mm-hmm. And most it's of team. us, it's a huge team. Uh, most of us come from the industry, mm-hmm. um, but uh, most of the bankers are uh, accountants. Mm-hmm. So I bring another side yeah um and we all come from production but from different side you know Mm -hmm. some have been working for uh broadcasters Mm -hmm. or from you know like institutions like sadek and telefilm Mm -hmm. so it's it's really interesting to bring all of our expertise together and i think that it gives us a greater understanding of you know our clients of their their goals. Yeah, and, I mean, uh, they must be eternally grateful <laughs> <laughs> that there's someone that has done it, you know, because obviously that is that makes such a huge difference if you're working with someone that needs to help you facilitate it. I, I feel like often, you know, with the banking products, they're the facilitators of what needs to be achieved because, you know, they bring important resources like, like cash. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, so if you're explaining something to someone that has done it, you know, they probably need to speak with you for half an hour instead of, you know, several days with <laughs> other people where you need to explain how the industry works and why they want to do it this way or not that way. Uh, yes, so. and, and and I think maybe we, we have more empathy mm. or we, we understand their challenges, we understand that they're going through ups and downs, we understand that, you know, it, it can take many years uh, to get a project <laughs> yeah. off the ground. Yeah. So, yes. So when um, I just want to go back real quick when you first kind of you know uh, joined the industry, I guess by becoming an entertainment lawyer. How did you feel um, when you left law school uh, and you joined that practice? Um, how did you learn the ins and outs of the industry? Because I, um, you know, when when I was kind of getting interested in being in the entertainment industry, I always found it super difficult to find. You know, there's not one handbook you can buy, and it's like read this and then you'll know how it works. Um, how, how did you do that? Did you have someone that was guiding you through the process? Did you read something uh, that kind of explained it all to you? How, did, how was I, that for you? I had a wonderful uh, mentor uh, who spent a great deal of time with me to uh, really teach me the ins and outs of the entertainment industry. I also attended several conferences. I probably read a few books, but you're right. You don't learn that much from reading books. Um, but no, it, it's really that that mentor that I, that mm. I had. Uh, in, in Montreal at the time when I started, the uh, entertainment industry was very small, mm-hmm. and there were really two or three lawyers were like senior in in that sector and I was working for one of of them as a junior lawyer and he really like uh, taught me everything. Well, that's quite lucky. I mean, first that someone actually took the time to recognize that you have a creative spark as well. You said you're part of a theater group, but then Uh had the legal training. So I'm, I'm always interested in how you can break into an industry like this where it's already hard to break in anyways, uh, I think. Um, so it's it's quite nice to see that you had someone that says, look, yeah. this is... Yeah, that was uh, very generous of his time. <laughs> 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 very patient. <laughs> yes. So from there, um, you worked as a lawyer, uh, worked a lot on you know, 
contracting, giving everything a structure? Was there a specific event where you went like, oh, no, you know, this is what I want to do now? I think I had always felt that I did not completely belong mm. in the legal like profession, to mm -hmm. the, that I had a kind of a double personality, <laughs> uh, oh. that there was a part of me that was different. And the really, really nice thing about being in the in production and being in the entertainment world is that that two sides of my personality could be nurtured yeah. and that like a yin and yang job <laughs> oh completely completely and i i think it would be difficult for me to be uh, maybe a traditional banker because that other side of me would not be nurtured. But I remember when I was in production, I was missing, you know, men and women in suits. And, yeah. <laughs> you know, I, <laughs> so it, there, there was always really these, these two sides mm. that I felt needed to, yeah, to be nurtured. And uh, so it, it, it really came naturally that, uh, yes. And then uh, the, basically the opportunity came along and you're like, all right, let's, yes. let's do that. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, interesting, because uh, um, when, when I was doing investment banking, I, I also always felt that I, I felt a bit like I was the creative among the bankers yes. and the banker among the creatives. Uh, personally, I felt like, you know, I, I wouldn't describe myself as creative, but I appreciate creativity. And then when you talk to bankers that work in different industries, you know, like maybe something technical, and you're always like, oh my God, this is the most boring application of <laughs> banking. Yeah. And, and I was always very happy to, to be on that side of the industry. Um, you know, you pursued a legal degree. Obviously, there's, there's plenty of good reasons to do that. Had you not done that, you wouldn't have had the experience in, you know, the profession. So, for example, if you had said, no, you want, I want to be an actress, you would have never gotten around to living that side of you. Because you said, you know, there, there is two sides. So I'm, I'm wondering, how did you manage to kind of bring those two sides together? Well, when I was really practicing law, I was still performing oh, okay. in, <laughs> in my amateur troupe theater. So that was the way I was like nurturing my other side. Yeah. And uh, when I was more involved in production, I, yeah, I, I felt ways to really nurture my more rational side. Yeah. Uh, well, there was plenty of paperwork to go through. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Interesting. But yeah. now I, I, I think it's a perfect combination. Interesting. Okay. So now yes. in banking, you feel like you're exposed like equal amounts to paperwork and uh, you know, creative Yes. Work uh, that you need to have a look at. Um, yes. So um, talk to me a little bit about kind of how does a day in your life look like? Because obviously you're involved in so many different projects from a banking side. And it's the same for you as everyone else. You come to the office, you open your email and there's like 100 messages waiting. How do you make sure you spend, like how do you divide your time between the different activities and make sure you stay on top of the projects that you're working on? Well, an ideal day would be a day where you spend most of your time either spending time with your clients mm -hmm. or in business development, yeah. uh, meeting potential new clients, yeah. and also reading about the industry mm -hmm. to be better equipped to yeah. serve your clients. Uh, Unfortunately, <laughs> <laughs> I was about to say, in an ideal day, I would go to the gym in the morning. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, there's uh, some time that you need to spend mm. uh, doing some admit work yeah. and, you know, preparing your recommendation to credit yeah. and, and really analyzing the file. And that's also part of, mm. uh, of being a banker. Uh, there's you know, like, yeah, a part of my day, uh, really uh, reviewing material supplied by the producers and making a determination of whether we can go yeah. forward or not. And there's another portion that is uh, really dedicated to uh, really spending time with my yeah. clients yeah. and understanding their business. I mean, that's such a valuable thing because I, I always feel like 
uh, banking for the entertainment industry is a lot about translating, uh, you know, the ideas that someone has to fit or be properly explained within the framework of an organization like a bank. Yes. Because uh, obviously there's lots of internal rules, as you said, you know. You're <laughs> Yes, you're absolutely right. And, you know, before I became a, a banker, uh, I was a, a client of the National Bank, and oh, okay. I, I had absolutely no idea what <laughs> was going on behind the scenes. Interesting. All yeah. the work yeah. that needed to be done yeah. in order for a file to be approved. Yeah. I, I had absolutely no yeah. idea. So you went from being frustrated that you were asked for so many documents and this and that, and can you please provide that? No, to the <laughs> contrary. You know, like for me, it was seamless. They were fast, they were flexible. I was even more in admiration mm -hmm. uh, after I joined the bank because yeah. I realized that what amount of work and... Uh, oh, interesting. So yes. they realized the black box you were seeing was actually much bigger. <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> uh, uh, and all the regulations mm -hmm. and all the reporting. And uh, so, no, no, I was even more impressed. Interesting, yeah. Yes, because I think it's one of the things that makes us different, maybe as a bank, as mm -hmm. compared to you know other banks, is that we tend to be really uh, more agile, more mm. flexible, uh, we want to be the bank of, you know, entrepreneurs. It's yeah. uh, our motto. That's what we're trying to do. And uh, yeah. so it's, that's our daily challenge. You Which know? is like, actually, uh, yeah, I was about to say, that's actually a great motto because, uh, you know, as if being an entrepreneur isn't hard enough, then if you have to comply with, you know, someone else's system, which exists for good reasons, yes. and as, as an entrepreneur, you already have, a mindset where you you know you want to achieve something you want to you know make something work you want to create something um so i think it's always a matter of like hey i'm i'm happy to work with you just like tell me what you need and so it's great to have an organization that has that spirit how how do you feel um that works so when when you're an entrepreneur and you work with the bank how um how does the relationship usually start how do you go from you know, just understanding the problem to solving it. We meet new clients in very different circumstances. It mm -hmm. can be at a market, it can be uh, through a referral. I think that the first thing we're really trying to do is understand their their business mm -hmm. and understand their, their needs, but they usually come with uh, a project. Something specific to work on. Yes, no. mm -hmm. yes. I was just wondering when you were a client, you know, and you said you were working with the bank, how you had met them and then worked with them uh, when when you were still on the production side. You know, like the fact that I was a, a, a lawyer by mm. uh, background made it really easy yeah. because I knew exactly uh, what type of documentation they would be requiring. Yeah. I knew exactly. You were the perfect client. <laughs> I, well, yeah, I, I, I was kind of a good client for well. them. And now that I'm on the other side, yeah. uh, it's not always the case. I need to explain to the clients mm. why this document is required or why we're asking X, Y, Z questions. Yeah. So it's a bit different. Yeah. Having seen this from both sides, is there something you wish people would understand better or maybe even now that you're on, let's say, the in, inside uh, that you had known uh, when you were uh, a client? Something to understand the bank better. They know that we're highly regulated, mm -hmm. but they don't necessarily uh, understand all the repercussions. Yeah. But it's not necessarily for them to, to understand. When I was in investment banking and I would speak with, potential clients or clients about fundraising, for example, but actually very few of them I felt would take like the mental perspective of the investor and think about like, what, what does the investor want? For me, that's always a great way to, you know, anticipate how that process is going to look like. And then you would speak with uh, people and say, look, but an investor works this way. That means we have to present this so that they can understand it. You don't have to translate it. In, in banking and obviously working with banks myself, I, I ask myself the same question. How does their process look like and what can I do to, you know, 
facilitate it. And I feel like often people, especially that are on the creative side, they maybe underestimate the bureaucracy that is there and they, they always perceive it as something that works against them. And I always try to say, no, no, it's there to work for you, you know, so it works properly and yes. things are structured. Too. Yes, well, I, I think maybe that sometimes the clients tend to underestimate the time that it requires to uh, to, le to really go through the process and they underestimate maybe the risks mm -hmm. associated to their project. <laughs> <laughs> It's going to be amazing. Yeah. It's going to be the best thing ever. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> okay. Yes. I think it's the two major challenges. Mm. And yes, and that's why we need to, to explain. And I think that uh, if they give us also ammunition mm -hmm. to uh, really act on, on their behalf yeah. and, and show the project or, 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 or show their financing needs in mm -hmm. the best favorable light. Yeah, because that's, that's the thing, right? Like you have to actually make their case internally. Yes. Uh, almost like an internal trial. So it helps your lawyer. Uh, you can, you know, present the case. Uh, and then, I mean, most organizations, there's probably more than one person making the decision whether to move forward with this. So not only do you have to convince one or more people, but someone that also... Uh, you know, has a very different perspective. And in a way, you know, we're their agent. Yeah. Uh, we're their oh, agent that's, in, that's in, in the sense that <laughs> we're representing uh, them yeah. and we're representing them to a credit committee yeah. and we are the yeah. intermediary. Yeah. And that's probably the most challenging aspect of the work yeah. uh, because we really want to, to help our clients yeah. and we make recommendations. That's such a beautiful way to describe it, actually, yeah. The, the the financial agent <laughs> of of the uh, the company or the producer because yeah that's exa exactly what you're doing right uh, and yes uh, and and we're really also trying to be a one stop shop in in, yeah. in the sense that you know we're not only financing projects we can finance their equipment their building we mm -hmm. can also help them with their personal needs yeah which is always helpful I mean if if you bring everything under one roof. It, it always helps you as well as a client. Cause yes, yes, you have yeah. one contact yeah. person. Yeah. And, uh, and and the bank knows what you're up to, so that's always helpful. I'm wondering, you've obviously been doing this for a while. Do you feel like uh, since, for example, the global financial crisis, things have changed dramatically in banking or for you know, producers in how to work with the bank? Um, do you feel like there have been any like major changes apart from... The, the regulations that were put in place um, afterwards? I uh, think there's definitely more uh, regulation, mm -hmm. but all the Canadian banks were extremely uh, solid and were yeah. extremely... Conservative. Conservative, <laughs> like before the uh, financial crisis. Mm -hmm. So I haven't seen, you mm -hmm. know, like a dramatic change in in the way we've been handling business okay. in uh, mm -hmm. in our sector since the financial crisis. No, most of the regulation has been to find new ways of dealing with the financial sector, especially like financial products. Yes. Um, but I mean, every once in a while you come across something that changed. You mentioned uh, Canada. Do you feel... Uh, there's a special advantage of being in Canada because obviously you said, you know, you're going to markets everywhere. Uh, you have clients everywhere. Do you feel like uh, there's something special about Canada um, that lets you do things differently? I think in terms of banking, uh, we're probably not that different from other banks, mm -hmm. except again, as I said, that uh, we really tend to be more maybe agile and, and, and flexible. Mm -hmm. And we have this uh, really like deep understanding of, uh, of the industry. I think that what really attracts uh, people to Canada is the talent. We, we have mm -hmm. uh, wonderful talent. Uh, talent and and more and more in in Montreal mm -hmm. uh, people come for you know talent in visual effects talents mm -hmm. in uh, yeah. uh, artificial intelligence and in in production and it's a nice you know like combination 
uh, between U.S. and, and Europe, mm -hmm. a nice way for Europeans to maybe yeah. get into uh, the U.S. and get into North America. Mm -hmm. So we've seen uh, many European companies coming to uh, Montreal to mm -hmm. set up a division. Yeah. And uh, serving their servicing their clients from the U.S. and from Canada yeah. out of Montreal. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's uh, that's something that put Canada or or Quebec as well on the the map is just like the level of service production, but also talent that is there. And you know, you got tax rebates, got a bank like you, uh, you know, got the infrastructure like very talented people on the ground. Um, well, and I think we were extremely nice. <laughs> that's true, that's true, that's true. <laughs> no, but it's funny because uh, uh, recently um, a, a tour was uh, organized uh, to welcome some uh, American uh, producers mm -hmm. and uh, one of the producers that came told me that it was next to a miracle <laughs> uh, his trip was next to America. I said, oh my God, you know, you came and it was about, you know, minus 20 and it was like... Uh, you came at the worst time. Uh, you came at the worst time. And what did you like enjoy that much about Montreal? Yeah. And it's essentially like the the level of talent and the people. He felt like uh, so like uh, welcome and... Uh, it makes such a huge difference and... And I think when you look at stuff on paper, you forget that component, you know, that uh, none of the projects you work on are short term. These are all multi-year yes, projects. Yes, exactly, and, exactly. And you will have to deal yes, with these people. Uh, yes, so. <laughs> yes. Do I feel like, you know, spending three three years of my life exactly. in this place? Yeah, yeah. That's and, exactly it, you know, it's your lifetime. And uh, apparently what what he was also telling me is that if he tells his crew, his DOP and his line producer mm. and his cast, you know, like that... Uh, We're going to shoot in Canada. Yeah, yeah <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. Oh, that's that's quite lovely. Exactly. Uh, uh, um, so we, we spoke a lot about the past and, and, and before we wrap this up, I, I want to know your thoughts on the future. Is there something, some trends or something you're watching right now that you feel, you know, people should pay attention to? Do you foresee any big changes in the industry? If um, I, I look at uh, my clients mm. and what it, it's, it's probably true in, in Canada, but I'm sure it's probably true elsewhere in the world, is the fact that our clients are really evolving uh, and not only doing traditional um, TV and motion picture mm -hmm. production, but they're also getting into uh, into VR, into okay. live shows, entertainment. Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, that's why a few days ago we announced that we were changing our name from motion picture okay. and television division to uh, creative industries oh, group. That's smart. Uh, because I, I, I think our multi, you know, like our clients are also getting more into multimedia mm -hmm. and or mixed media. Mm -hmm. So that I think is definitely a, a, a trend that uh, we're we're seeing. Yeah. Uh, what is also interesting is seeing countries that didn't use to develop IPs. Mm -hmm. Uh, like uh, India mm -hmm. and Indonesia and mm -hmm. China now uh, really developing their own IPs mm -hmm. and sending work to Canada. Whereas before it was completely the other way around. I was about to say it was the other way around, right? Yes, they yes, went, yes. <laughs> went there to take care, you know, take advantage of the cost savings. and Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and, and now, you know, like I uh, finance a lot of service tax credits mm -hmm. where the copyright owners are Asian, Interesting. Uh, Indian. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's really, really an interesting uh, trend. I guess the other thing I'm, I'm seeing is the, uh, the, the market is uh, quite mature, at least again in, in Canada, uh, indigenous mm -hmm. Local programming is 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 quite mature, so mm -hmm. people are really trying to uh, 
uh, take advantage of uh, international co-productions, mm. also more uh, high-budget TV series mm -hmm. being produced uh, with international players. It seems like the lines are blurring everywhere, whether that's yes. from medium or country or you know where a product is being then you know disseminated uh, eventually that you know you'll have a show that's a canadian uk french co-production and will actually air in all these territories yes. uh, instead of just you know like it used to be back in the day there's it was either a canadian show or a french show or a us show uh, that there's definitely more collaboration i mean it's never been easier before in history to collaborate with someone on the other side of the planet uh so yeah um thank you so much for your time it's wonderful speaking with you uh looking forward to the next time <laughs> <laughs> and um i hope you uh have a fantastic market thank you very much thank you so much for listening everyone we'd love to hear from you now please let us know what you think of the show and this episode leave us a comment send us a message or tweet And we're looking forward to welcoming you on our next episode. By the way, you can follow Media CFO on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And if you haven't already, please subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts and rate and review this podcast. Again, thank you for listening and bye-bye. The Media CFO podcast is hosted by Tobias Sieger. Our executive producer is Bridget Scar. Digital editing by Christina Vogt and Atanasios Karakantas. Designed by Daniel Cortes. Many thanks to Anouk van Gemen and Frederick Jäger for their creative review. The notes for the show can be found on www.themediacfo.com. Copyright 2019, Polybris Studios. <laughs>